A human life is basically just a long series of decisions. Every day we're sort of bombarded with hundreds and hundreds of individual choices that we have to make. And sometimes life comes at you fast and you have to decide right now. Other times we maybe have more time to deliberate. So that's what I want to talk about today. I want to talk about how we make decisions. And I want us to think about how rational we are when we make decisions. Sometimes we use our gut, sometimes we deliberate a lot. But to what extent are we rational actors? The behavioral economist Daniel Kahneman, you may have heard of, he wrote a very popular book called Thinking Fast and Slow. In his book, Daniel Kahneman outlines a dual system model for how we make decisions. It's a dual systems processing model. We have two different ways of making decisions, two different systems that operate sort of in parallel. We have system one, that's a highly automatic, a very quick system for making very quick decisions. This system is automatic, it's quick, it requires little or no effort. It seems to be mostly involuntary. You can think this as maybe sort of deciding with your gut, using your gut reaction. You can contrast that with system two. System two is very deliberative. It's conscious, it's deliberate, it's effortful. It involves a lot of agency and choice and often a lot of concentration. Both of these systems come into play pretty much every day of our lives. We use them in different kinds of scenarios to make different kinds of decisions. So we use system one when we say judge one object as more distant than another if we're driving. Or we might use system one, the automatic system, to orient ourselves to the source of a noise. Or to make a disgust face in response to a disgusting smell. Even something complex like driving on an empty road or driving a route that you're very familiar with can become very automatic. We wind up using that system one. We also, unfortunately, wind up using that highly automatic system one to stereotype each other. It's a very automatic kind of bias that kicks in almost any time we are interacting with other people. But there are lots of other more benign aspects of cognition that are handled by the system, like whenever we hear sounds or understand a sentence in the language that we know. And you can contrast this with system two, with that deliberative system. If you do something like file your taxes, it's time consuming and it's arduous and it takes a lot of thought and concentration. But even something really simple like walking faster than your natural walking speed, at least at first, requires a sort of deliberative kind of decision making. Or if you go to the grocery store and you want to compare two prices for cost and value, well, how do I get the most for my money? I have to use system two. It requires some thought. Maybe I have to memorize a list. Or learning a new language as an adult. Something that's very difficult and effortful and conscious for us. So we have these two systems, and they're both very useful, and they both sort of handle different things. But errors can arise when we use automatic forms of processing as shortcuts, when maybe we should have used a more deliberative form of processing instead. We are very often making decisions about the likelihood of uncertain events. So when we find ourselves saying something like, I think that maybe it'll rain tomorrow, or chances are, that test is going to be postponed, or it's unlikely that this will be overlooked. We are engaging in a certain kind of probabilistic reasoning. We are doing reasoning over the probability of future events. So the question I have is, how do people assess the probability of an uncertain event or the value of an uncertain quantity? Do we use our automatic system one, or do we use our more deliberative system two? So let's do some quick math right now, and we'll see sort of how this works. Suppose the sporting goods store sells a bat and a ball for $1.10 total. And we know that the bat costs $1 more than the ball. How much does the ball cost? Here's another scenario. If it takes five machines, five minutes to make five widgets, how long would it take 100 machines to make 100 widgets? 
Okay, one more. On a lake, there's a patch of lily pads. Every day, the patch doubles in size. If it takes 48 days for the patch to cover the whole lake, how many days does it take for the patch to cover half the lake? I bet you want to know the answers to these, right? Let's go over it. A bat and a ball costs $1.10 total. The bat costs a dollar more. How much does the ball cost? Is it 10 cents? No, it's five cents. And the bat costs a dollar five because five cents and a dollar five makes a dollar ten. And a dollar five is a dollar more than five cents. What about the machines? If it takes five machines five minutes to make five widgets, it'll take a hundred machines five minutes to make a hundred widgets. Even though my gut reaction tells me that it should be a hundred minutes, it just fits that pattern. A hundred machines, a hundred minutes, a hundred widgets. No, it's actually five minutes. Okay, what about the lily pads? If it takes 48 days for the lily pads to cover the whole lake and they double in size every day, how many days does it take to cover half the lake? I want to say 24 because it's half, but it's doubling every day, which means it'll go from one half to whole in just one day, from day 47 to day 48. So it takes 47 days for the patch to cover the whole lake. So there's something going wrong here. My gut reaction is telling me one thing. It tells me the ball costs 10 cents. It tells me the machines take 100 minutes. It tells me the lily pads take 24 days to cover half the lake. But those answers are wrong. They are mathematically wrong. And this has been tested a lot. And even Harvard graduates have been tested with these kinds of questions. And the finding has been that people are kind of bad at this. Because we rely on that highly automatic system, that system one. The only way to get the right answer to these kinds of questions is to use your more deliberative system too. But we kind of don't want to. We want to just rely on that highly automatic system because it's kind of easier. And we have very strong gut feelings about this. So if you didn't get these right, I don't think you should feel bad. I think I fell for these when I first saw them too. It's expected that we will rely on our automatic system one to answer these questions, even though it turns out to be wrong. A takeaway from this might be that Human beings kind of suck at reasoning sometimes. Of course, not all the time. Sometimes we're very good at reasoning, but at least some of the time, it kind of seems like we're not that good at this. Maybe a more charitable way of expressing this would be to say that we are cognitive misers. This is what psychologists Susan Fisk and Shelley Taylor would say. They would say, people are sort of limited in their capacity to process information, so we take shortcuts when we can. And that sort of makes sense, I think. We are cognitive misers. We don't want to spend a lot of cognitive effort if we don't have to. And this is where heuristics come into play. Heuristics are cognitive shortcuts that reduce cognitive effort. So we have these judgment heuristics. These are principles that we can use to reduce complex tasks, like assessing probabilities or predicting values. We can reduce those to just some kind of simple judgment operations using kind of a rule of thumb or some kind of crude heuristic. So these are simple, they are often useful, but they can also systematically go awry and cause us to make incorrect assessments. And I wanna talk about three main types of heuristics, representativeness, availability, and anchoring. Representativeness is all about figuring out the probability that one thing is associated with or originates from something else. So if you're asked a question, what is the probability that A originates from B or that A is a member of the group B? Then we might use our representativeness heuristic to answer that question in a very quick and automatic way. When A is highly representative of B, then the probability that A originates from B is judged to be higher. We can illustrate this with a scenario. Steve is very shy and withdrawn. He's invariably helpful, but he has very little interest in people or in the world of reality. He's meek, he's tidy, he has a need for order and structure, and he has a passion for detail. So the question is, what do you think is more likely? Do you think it's more likely that Steve is an airline pilot, that he's a librarian, or that he's a professional athlete? I think that most of us would say, Steve kind of sounds like a librarian. 
Well, we don't actually have any information about what he does for a living. There's nothing in the scenario that tells us what his job is. So why do we all think he seems kind of like a librarian? Well, we've probably met some librarians, we've interacted with them, and we see there's maybe a certain kind of personality that tends to be associated with being a librarian. Maybe the librarians we've met in the past have been meek and tidy and helpful and maybe prefer books to people. So because Steve seems representative of what we think of librarians, we're going to judge the probability that he is a librarian is a lot higher than if he had a different sort of personality. And it might seem actually pretty reasonable. This doesn't seem irrational on the face of it. If we know that there's a correlation between A and B, and we see something that has those traits, it may not be irrational to assume a probability that they belong to that group if there is a strong correlation between the traits and the group itself. I mean, what if librarians really are all meek and tidy and helpful and prefer books to people? Then it's not so crazy to think maybe Steve is a librarian. Maybe that's why he has those traits. There is a problem though. Experiments have shown that we are not responsive to base rates. W what does that mean? What's a base rate? Well, the experimental paradigm here is, suppose we have a, a deck of cards and each card corresponds to a person. You're gonna flip over the cards one at a time and you're gonna read a description like the one that we just read. And you'll have to make a decision. Do you think that they belong to one profession or another? Do you think they're, I don't know, a lawyer or an engineer? So when you do this task, you're relying on your representativeness heuristic. You're going to rely on how that description correlates with what we think a lawyer or an engineer is like. And that's how we will make our decision. I think it's probably pretty rational to make the decision that way, given that we don't have any other information that we could use. The problem comes in when the experimenter gives you another piece of information. So in this experiment, the experimenter will actually add another piece of information into the mix. The experimenter will say, here's the deck of cards, each one corresponds to a person. All of them will be either an engineer or a lawyer, but only 10% of them will be engineers. 90% of them will be lawyers. So when we do this task, we should be thinking about that. We should be thinking about every time I assign a person to either lawyer or engineer, I should be thinking about the fact that only 10% of them are supposed to be engineers. What happens in practice is that people tend to ignore that piece of information. We rely only on representativeness, even though we should be modulating the heuristic based on the base rate based on the fact that we know that only 10% of them should be engineers and the other 90% should be lawyers. For some reason, that piece of information doesn't filter into our decision-making process because we're relying on the heuristic. So this is an example of where the heuristic can kind of lead us astray. It makes us less accurate because we're relying on that shortcut instead of using all of the information that we have access to. Here's another example. Linda is 31 years old. She's single, she's outspoken, she's very bright. She majored in philosophy. And as a student, she was deeply concerned with issues of discrimination and social justice. And she also participated in anti-nuclear demonstrations. Okay, which of these do you think is more probable? Is it more probable that Linda is a bank teller or that Linda is a bank teller and is active in the feminist movement. Most of us are probably going to want to say that the second statement seems more probable, that Linda is a bank teller and is active in the feminist movement. But if we evaluate this logically, it is actually impossible for the second statement to be more probable than the first. And the reason for that is that the second statement is a conjunction that includes the first statement. Linda is a bank teller and is active in the feminist movement is necessarily less probable than Linda is a bank teller alone because it includes Linda as a bank teller as part of the conjunction. That means that in every possible world where Linda is a bank teller and is active in the feminist movement, the first statement, Linda is a bank teller, will also be true. But of course, there will be some scenarios where Linda's a bank teller but isn't active in the feminist movement. Then only the first one will be true. So there's just no way, there's no logically conceivable way that Linda is a bank teller and active in the feminist movement could be more probable than Linda just being a bank teller. 
So this is another example of using representativeness. There were lots of details in that story that maybe led us to believe that Linda being active in the feminist movement seemed likely. But we're using that information at the expense of some very basic logical reasoning. Can't be more likely that she is two things than one thing. Of course it has to be more likely that she's just one thing than that thing plus something else. But for some reason it's the representativeness that matters more. Okay, one more example. Suppose you walk into a casino. You want to make some money. You see a roulette wheel. You know that the odds of the wheel coming up black and red are exactly equal. It has the same number of black and red spaces. But as you watch spin after spin after spin, you notice something. It's come up black more than 10 times in a row. So maybe you start to feel a little itchy. It's going to come up red soon. We're overdue. It can't keep coming up black forever, right? It has to come up red. The longer we go without a red, the higher the probability of red becomes, right? This is a sure bet, and it only gets better the longer the black keeps coming up. Well, actually, no. This is called the gambler's fallacy. It's a misconception about how probability works. It's the belief that chance is some kind of self-correcting process, and if there's a deviation in that process in one direction, that that would induce a deviation in the opposite direction to restore some kind of equilibrium, right? It keeps coming up black. Well, at some point it's got to come up red to sort of even out. But of course this overlooks a very important detail, and that is that every time the wheel is spun, the odds of red and black are exactly 50-50. That probability does not change. It is always going to be 50-50. The only reason that sometimes we see long stretches of black and, or long stretches of red is just random chance. There's no way to predict it. The probability does not change. Let's talk about another heuristic. Let's talk about availability. This heuristic has to do with how people assess the probability of something based on how easy it is to think of instances or occurrences of that thing. How easily can they be brought to mind? This is useful because I think it's often true that things that happen very frequently are things that we notice very frequently. They are things that we are likely to remember. They are things that easily come to mind. The problem comes when we reason in the other direction. Just because something comes to mind easily doesn't mean that it was probable to begin with. Let's take an example. Which is more likely? That a word starts with K, or that a word will have K as its third letter? This is another case where I think we're probably all going to share an intuition and say, I think the words that start with K seem more probable. It seems like there are more words that start with K than have K as a third letter. That's so specific. How many words are there with K as a third letter? Well, it turns out that that's false. Actually, there are a lot more words with K as a third letter than a first letter. Why do we get such a wrong intuition here? It has to do with how easily we can bring examples into our mind. How many examples of words that start with K can you think of? You're probably going to say things like kangaroo and kitchen and kick. It's pretty easy to come up with examples of words that start with K. But what about words that have K as a third letter? Well, what about a word like ask, or acknowledge, or like, or bake, or make, or take? There are actually a lot of words that have K as the third letter. It's not quite as uncommon as it seems. It's just kind of hard to look up those words in our memory. It's much easier for us to access words that start with K than words that have K as the third letter. And because it's so easy to think of words that start with K, that might lead us to the wrong assumption that words that start with K are much more frequent. I think the most salient and most relevant example of availability comes from media representation. What kinds of things do you see in the news if you watch the news on a daily basis? You're likely to see things like disasters and violence, horrible stuff. And that might cause you to overestimate the frequency with which those horrible things happen. Of course, horrible things are horrible. Nobody wants there to be terrible accidents or natural disasters. 
but they get a disproportionate amount of airtime. And that may cause us to overestimate the likelihood of those kinds of horrible, disastrous events. So here's some fun facts. Every day, 3,287 people die in car accidents versus two people dying in airplane accidents. And yet, there is a very pervasive fear of air travel, whereas fear of automobile travel is very rare. Almost no one is afraid of riding in a car. Not like how people are afraid of riding on a plane. If we look on a per mile basis, given how much airplanes travel, air travel is over a hundred times safer than car travel. So why do we have this pervasive belief that airplanes are dangerous? Well, it may have to do with the fact that we don't get constantly bombarded with images of car crashes. There may actually be two things going on here. Airplane crashes are more available in the sense that they're easier for us to recall because we attach a much stronger negative emotional valence to them. They're more horrific. And so we're more likely to remember them because they constitute larger disasters. It may also perversely be the fact that they are so infrequent that we are so likely to remember them. They are very exceptional events. Because they're exceptional, they're extremely newsworthy. Whenever an airplane crashes, it's all over the news for the entire news cycle. We're all going to hear about it. But cars are crashing every day, and we're not going to hear about the vast majority of those. Car crashes are so common, it doesn't even count as news. We're very unlikely to hear about the number of people who are dying in car accidents because it's so common, it's not noteworthy. So this causes a weird kind of backward effect. The fact that we can so easily remember airplane crashes is perhaps caused by the fact that they are rare, but the fact that we can remember them well leads us to believe that they are frequent. It's pretty strange. This is just a really nice example of how these heuristics can cause us to reach wrong conclusions. That by trying to do that mental shortcut using these heuristics like availability, how easily I can think of something, leads me to really over or underestimate the probability of an event. Okay, the last type of heuristic is called anchoring. Anchoring is interesting to me because the other heuristics I can say, oh, this seems like there's a rational reason why we might make those assumptions. Yeah, things that are more frequent do tend to be easier to remember. Or things that are representative do have some kind of correlation with the thing that we're assuming, and so it's not so weird that we would assume a higher probability. Anchoring is a little bit weird because it doesn't really have this kind of underlying rational assumption, or at least I can't think of one. We can illustrate anchoring with an example. Suppose I ask you the question, is the average price of a German car more or less than $100,000? What if I asked a different question? What if I said, is the average price of a German car more or less than $20,000? What if I follow this up by asking, what do you think the actual average price of a German car is? Give me your best estimate. Well, it turns out that that initial number that I give you, even though it has nothing really to do with your estimate, it does affect how high or low your estimate is going to be. So if I ask you if the German car is more or less than $100,000, and then I say, well, what do you think the average actually is? Your estimate may be much higher then if I had asked you, do you think it's more or less than $20,000? This is a little bit weird because the number is totally unconnected with what we're asking next, with our follow-up question. So it seems a bit odd that we are adjusting our estimate, we are anchoring our estimate to that initial number. Maybe in this example you can think, oh, it, I mean, maybe it does make sense. Maybe I was asking whether it was more or less than $100,000 because I was already thinking it was somewhere in that ballpark. I can understand how that might shift our estimates upward. Or if I ask $20,000, maybe it's because I had a prior assumption that it was pretty low and I'm shifting your estimate downwards. But we see anchoring come into play in cases where the number genuinely has absolutely nothing to do with the following task. In fact, when we do this class in person, sometimes we'll just write a number on the board and we'll say, this number is meaningless. You don't have to pay attention to it at all. It's not gonna have anything to do with anything else that we do in class. Then later we'll ask the class to estimate some large quantity like, what do you think is the population of New York City? Now you do this on different days with different numbers and you get really different estimates. 
the numbers have absolutely nothing to do with each other. And even if you know that the numbers have nothing to do with each other, even if you know that that initial number is in no way relevant, it still causes that anchoring effect. Here's another version that I really like from Daniel Kahneman. Suppose I give you this series of numbers all multiplied together. 1 times 2 times 3 times 4 times 5 times 6 times 7 times 8. And I ask you, what do you think the product of all those numbers is? What if I asked it the other way around? What if I say, what do you think is the product of 8 times 7 times 6 times 5 times 4 times 3 times 2 times 1? Should that change your answer? Obviously it shouldn't because it's the same numbers being multiplied together and we know that the order doesn't matter when you're multiplying numbers. But when they did this study, what they found is that the estimates were very, very different depending on the order in which the numbers were presented. When the numbers were presented from low to high, 1 times 2 times 3, etc., the median estimate was only 512. When the numbers were arranged from high to low, 8 times 7 times 6 times 5, the estimates were much higher. 2,250. So we're anchoring to that initial few numbers. When we see it starts with 1, 2, 3, 4, that's going to drive our, our estimate downward because the initial numbers that we see are very low. But when we start with higher numbers, 8, 7, 6, 5, our estimate goes up because those initial numbers are higher. Obviously, multiplying these numbers together for most of us is not something that we can easily do in our heads. So we're not really doing a lot of math, we're sort of just uh, guesstimating, and we're using this heuristic to try to figure out where our estimate should be. In case you're curious, the actual answer to this question is 40,320, which you might notice is about 20 times higher than even the highest estimate. That's a little bit interesting on its own. I'm not sure why we're so bad at estimating the quantities of these large numbers. But the more important fact is that our admittedly terrible estimates are also subject to this anchoring effect. So these heuristics, representativeness, availability, anchoring, these represent quick and automatic ways of thinking or mental shortcuts, which we think have evolved because they tend to be helpful or useful for us. But of course they can systematically lead us astray in our probability judgments. So then the question is, how rational are human beings? Well, Dan Dennett would say that maybe humans are predictable in so far as we are approximately boundedly rational. So this idea of bounded rationality, it's sort of like we are semi-rational. We have semi-rational behavior. We are maybe a little bit irrational, but we're irrational in very predictable ways. And we are rational and irrational in the ways that most benefit us, especially when we think about ourselves in an evolutionary context. So we can think of a couple different hypotheses here. One is that we were not designed, we're just the product of some brute causal forces that produced beings that are rational enough to survive, but not necessarily very rational, just rational enough to get by. But we might also say, well, maybe we really are rational, and sometimes using heuristics is more rational than strictly following rationality norms. Then the question becomes, when would it be more rational to use a heuristic instead of actually committing yourself to doing the calculation? How could it be more rational to use a shortcut than to actually do the math? Well, we have to think about evolutionary usefulness. Remember, we are evolved organisms, and so we are the way we are maybe for a reason, maybe because it was useful to our ancestors. Rational strategies are often slow and computationally expensive. Remember, we are cognitive misers. We don't want to waste a bunch of energy and time and effort to do the most accurate possible computations. Not if we can get away with doing something maybe a little bit less accurate. Following the rules of rational behavior is computationally demanding. It takes up energy, it takes up time. And we as agents have an interest in minimizing those costs. We are kind of lazy. But maybe we should think about the fact that it is kind of rational to be lazy. So it's sort of an optimization problem. We have to try to figure out what is the most optimal course of action that we can take that will get us the biggest yield, the best outcome, for the least amount of effort. 
In evolutionary terms, reducing effort is a huge deal. If you spend too much effort doing something, if you spend too much time making a decision, you may starve, you may miss an opportunity, you may be eaten by a predator. So the ability to make decisions quickly, even if they're less accurate, can be a huge boost. So this boundedly rational decision making can be thought of as a kind of constrained optimization problem. Boundedly rational agents are utility maximizers. At least once all of the constraints are made clear, once we are aware of all the constraints that are, we are operating under when we make decisions, suddenly the picture starts to look a lot more rational. And this is something that I kind of keep my, to myself as a sort of mantra, I think. Whenever someone does something that seems very irrational to me, I think to myself, is there something I don't know about their situation, about their environment, about their constraints, about their values? Maybe they just value very different things than what I value. Maybe they're acting perfectly rationally from their perspective. Maybe they're acting perfectly rationally for their situation. And there's an accuracy effort trade-off here, right? Information and computation cost time and effort. And our minds are going to rely on simple heuristics that are less accurate than strategies that use more information and more computation. Because it's worth it to save the time and save the energy. That becomes the rational choice. This creates sort of a paradox where the most rational choice that we can make is the irrational one, at least sometimes. That's bounded rationality in a nutshell. Maybe what's really rational is limiting your rationality a little bit. I think the coolest example of this is something called the gaze heuristic. So a lot of you have probably been in a situation at some point in your lives where you had to catch a falling object. If you've ever played baseball, this is a very common thing that happens many times during a baseball game. There will be an object flying through the air, the baseball. You have to catch it. You're not really in the place where it's going to land. It's just falling somewhere. So you have to kind of do two things. You have to move to the place where you think it's going to hit the ground and you have to intercept it. You have to somehow track its position, its movement, its speed, its trajectory, all of that in relation to your own. This is an incredibly complex computation. This leads us to a really natural question. How do we actually do this? It feels really trivial if it's something that you've done before, you can just sort of do it. You're like, I don't have to think about how to do it. I'm not doing any particular math in order to make this happen. I just kind of do it. But for a cognitive scientist, that's not really good enough. I want to know how we're able to do this. What's the algorithm that enables us to catch a falling object while it is moving and we are also moving? This very complex coordination problem. It turns out that there is an incredibly simple heuristic that we can use with high accuracy and very low effort. That heuristic is called the gaze heuristic. If you are moving towards a falling object, your eyes will be pointed towards that object at a certain angle. If you can coordinate your movement towards that object such that your viewing angle does not change as you approach, so that your eyes are always pointed the same direction, then as you approach the ball, you will wind up exactly where it is going to land at exactly the moment it is going to land there. It's the gaze heuristic. If I keep my eyes at a fixed gazing angle to this object as it falls, our paths will converge. That makes it very easy for me to intercept this falling object without doing a bunch of complicated mathematics. All I have to do is keep my eyes at a fixed angle. So there are very, very simple kinds of heuristics, very simple algorithms that you can use to solve what otherwise would be a very computationally complex operation. Okay, let's go over some of the key concepts from this lecture. We talked about dual systems processing. That's Daniel Kahneman's model where we actually have two different systems for handling decision making. Highly automatic system one and slower, more deliberative system two. We talked about heuristics those mental shortcuts that we can use to make decisions without requiring a tremendous amount of effort. And we talked about three main types of heuristics. We talked about representativeness, relying on correlations between groups and members to assess the probability of group membership. We talked about availability, using how easily something can be brought to mind as a heuristic in place of how probable you think it is. And we talked about anchoring, how even just being presented with a number, even if it's totally irrelevant, can bias our estimates. And we talked about bounded rationality, this idea that maybe being a little bit irrational by using these heuristics 
might actually be the most rational choice available to us because we are cognitive misers, because of that accuracy effort trade-off. Sometimes it's worth it to sacrifice a little bit of accuracy if we can save a lot of effort. In the next lecture, we're going to talk more about rationality, how rational are human beings, but we're going to look at a very specific case of how we evaluate logical propositions, and in particular, how that can be modulated by social cognition.